Today we are on Friday, the day that we call Good Friday, the day that Jesus was arrested and crucified. And so today I'm reading from Matthew 27. I'm reading selected verses from this chapter. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people reached the decision to have Jesus put to death. They bound him, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate, the governor. The governor said, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, That's what you say. Then Pilate said, Don't you hear the testimony they bring against you? But he didn't answer, not even a single word. So the governor was greatly amazed. It was customary during the festival for the governor to release to the crowd one prisoner, whomever they might choose. When the crowd had come together, Pilate asked them, whom would you like me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Christ. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and kill Jesus. The governor said, which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, they replied. Pilate said, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They all said, crucify him. But he said to them, why? What wrong has he done? They shouted even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere and that a riot was starting. So he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your problem. All the people replied, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped, then handed him over to be crucified. Last week, when we left Jesus, he was having supper with his friends. He announced during the meal to his disciples that one of them would betray him. Then he took bread and wine and transformed them into his body and blood. Matthew's gospel then tells us that after that they sang a hymn and then they went out to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was in that garden that Jesus prayed, Father, take this cup from me. It was in the garden where he was betrayed by his friend, companion, his disciple, Judas. It was from that garden that he was taken to the home of the high priest, Caiaphas. He was interrogated and found guilty in a secret trial late at night, right at the beginning of the Passover feast. Then, the next day, early in the morning, they take him to Antonia Fortress, the home of the governor, Pilate, Pontius Pilate. But Pilate finds no fault in Jesus, and he tries to release, them, release him by trading his life for Barabbas. But the crowd says, no, release Jesus Barabbas. Crucify Jesus of Nazareth. In a symbolic gesture, Pilate washes his hands, then sends Jesus off to be beaten and crucified. Jesus' fate is sealed. If you're a Christian, you probably know this story by heart because it is part of the story that is central to our faith as Christians. And there's so much that we can learn from this part of the story, more than I can ever fit into a single sermon. So today, I'd like to focus on some of the things that we may not know 
about this part of the story, but perhaps we should know because then the, by the time we get to Easter and the resurrection, hopefully we will have a better understanding of what it was that Christ did for us. First, let's take a look at the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the council of elders, 71 of them, who interrogated Jesus at the high priest's home. They were also the ones who controlled all of the activities in and around the temple. And they were the ones who, along with the Pharisees, had the most to lose if Jesus' ministry was allowed to continue. Now, normally, the Sanhedrin would only meet during the day, and they never met during the, the holy days, the, ho the holidays or the festivals. But this time, they meet in the middle of the night, in the middle of Passover, the most important of all the festivals. Why would they do that? It's the same reason why some of our branches of our government hold important votes while people sleep because they didn't want Jesus' followers to know what they were doing. Next, let's consider Jesus' interrogation by Pilate, the governor of the region. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was taken early in the morning to Pilate, the sole purpose of which was to have him sentenced to death. Now, many scholars believe that he was brought there to Pilate's residence sometime before daybreak. Now, how many of you are out on the street before daybreak? Not very many. And certainly in Jesus' time, that was not the time of day when a lot of people would have been available out on the street. Now, why do you suppose the religious authorities chose to take Jesus to the governor in the wee hours of the morning? because then they could control who was there. And they could control the crowd and tell them what to do and say. It is highly unlikely that the crowd assembled at Antonio Fortress that day was the same crowd that Jesus attracted earlier in the week. They were two different crowds. Instead, those people at Antonia Fortress were controlled by the religious authorities, and they did exactly what the religious authorities told them to do. After questioning Jesus, Pilate sees that Jesus has done nothing wrong, but he also knows that he has to save face. He cannot simply release him. So he cooks up a plan that he thinks is a fail-safe plan that will set Jesus free. He offers to release one prisoner in honor of the Passover feast. And the one prisoner that, they, that he offers in, uh, right next to Jesus is Jesus Barabbas, a notorious criminal. The crowd must choose Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Barabbas, who was a criminal, a murderer, and a traitor. Barabbas was not the kind of guy you wanted wandering around your neighborhood. Pilate is sure that the crowd will choose Jesus of Nazareth, and he will be set free. But what he doesn't know is that the crowd has been rigged by the religious authorities present that day. We want Barabbas, they shout. But what about Jesus the Christ, he asks. Crucify! 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 Pilate has no choice but to let Barabbas go and condemn Jesus the Christ to die a horrible death. Even though he knows in his heart that Jesus was an innocent man. And knowing these things helps us to understand a little bit more about whole, how this whole crucifixion thing came about. But we also need to understand a little bit more about Roman, the Roman Empire and how they perfected the art of torture. They believed that harsh punishment 
was a deterrent to crime. And Matthew tells us that Jesus was whipped or scourged before being crucified on the cross. Now, the Romans didn't use just any kind of whip. They used something called a flagrum or a fragulum, a short whip made of two or three leather leather ropes connected to a handle and and tied onto those leather ropes were pieces of metal, glass, and hooks. So when the victim was whipped with the flagrum, those pieces of metal and glass would tear into the flesh, causing deep lacerations and excessive bleeding and incredibly excruciating pain. Under Jewish law, the number of of lashes that you were allowed to receive was 40 minus 1. But under Roman law, there was no limit. So we have no idea how many times Jesus was scourged. We do know, however, that the Romans did not want the victim to die from the beating. They wanted to keep him alive so that he could be publicly humiliated by hanging on a cross. After being beaten, the scriptures tell us that Jesus carried his cross to the place called the skull. Now, it's highly unlikely that Jesus carried the whole cross like I did at the beginning of the worship service because the entire cross would have been too heavy. Instead, it is more likely that he carried the crossbar or the patibulum, as it was called in Rome. It's that horizontal bar that forms the cross. That piece alone would have weighed somewhere around 75 to 100 pounds. So carrying that part of the cross was still no small feat for a man who had been beaten nearly to death. But even Jesus couldn't carry his cross, that piece of the cross, all the way to Golgotha. So Simon of Cyrene is pulled from the crowd and made to carry it for him. When they arrived at the site of the crucifixion, the patibulum would have been attached to the stipes, which would be the vertical bar that that forms the cross. Now, how that actually happened is the subject of, of speculation. The stipes may have been laid down, and then the patibulum... Uh, nailed on top of it, or the victim may have been attached to the patibulum and then somehow hoisted up onto the stipes. Either way, the process of getting the victim into a hanging position would have been incredibly painful, as we can only imagine. There were also various ways that victims were attached to the cross. Some had their arms bound with ropes, as you can see in this image on On the screen, others were attached using nails. We know from the scriptures that Jesus himself was nailed to the cross. But the positioning of the nails has been misinterpreted over the years. Scripture tells us that the nails were driven into the hands, and so naturally we think that they went through the palm. But that would have never held the weight of the victim. So instead, it is more likely that the nails were were driven into the wrist, in, the, in between the bones, so that they the, that would hold the weight of the man. And in Greek, the word that is used for hand also includes the wrist. It's also likely that his feet were not positioned one on top of the other, as we've sometimes seen in artistic uh, interpretations. Instead, archeolo- archaeological evidence has shown that the nails were probably instead, uh, that the victim straddled the cross and the nails were driven through the ankle bone into the cross. Now we also know that attached to the patibulum was a protrusion called a sedile. Uh, You can see it here on the screen, there on the front of the stipes. Many believe that that was a place where the victim's feet would have been placed, but recent evidence has shown that that was not the case. It was not a seat intended to give the victim 
comfort, but rather it was used as a means of temptation, a way to make him suffer even more. The body was positioned so he could not sit on the sedile unless he lowered his body down. That would cause great strain and stress on the shoulders because of the, the hands being nailed to the cross. And it would also have been very difficult to breathe, which meant that in order to breathe, the victim would have had to pull himself up by pushing on his nailed feet and pulling on his nailed hands. And because the victims were usually crucified naked, in order to increase the level of humiliation, the wounds on his back from the scourging earlier in the day would have scraped against the rough wood of the cross, causing even more pain. Historians also believe that the crosses used by the Romans were not real tall. They weren't 18 or 20 feet. It was more likely that the entire apparatus was more like nine feet, maybe just about as how tall is this one here, so that the victim's face would have been within reach of his family. The bodies also were often left to hang there long after they were dead, and because they were lowered to the ground, animals could pick at the flesh and bone, leaving very little for a proper burial. Because crucifixion was used as a way of deterring crime, the Romans reserved it for the most heinous of crimes, and its victims were meant to suffer long and hard. More than likely, they died of asphyxiation because they could not breathe, and sometimes they would hang on the cross for days before they would die. Scripture tells us that Jesus hung on the cross for about six hours. It was a blessing for him that it went so quickly. Sometimes the Roman soldiers sped up the process by breaking the victim's legs or piercing the spear through the side. And as I mentioned, often they were left hanging there after death as further humiliation of not receiving a proper burial. Crucifixion was indeed a horrible way to die. And I know that for some of you today, this message is very uncomfortable because the realities of crucifixion are uncomfortable. And knowing how much Jesus suffered leads us to ask the question, why? Why did Jesus have to die in such a horrible way? There are many theories that have been offered to help us answer that question. They're called atonement theories, and most of them involve a system of payment. These theories suggest that in order for us to receive forgiveness from God for the sins that we have committed, a ransom must be paid either to the forces of evil or to the forces of good, to God. For example, when we say that Jesus died for my sin or Jesus paid the price for my sin, we are implying that Jesus died in order to pay our own debt, a debt that we could not pay on our own. And some have suggested that we develop this understanding because as Christians, we don't fully understand the sacrificial system found in the Old Testament. Yes, animals were sacrificed on the altar in the temple, and yes, those sacrifices involved the shedding of blood. But sacrifice in Judaism was not about payment for sin. It was about making something sacred by giving a gift to God. Part of the sacrificial animal, the sacrificed animal, was given as a gift to God, and it went up to God in the smoke. But the rest was most often eaten by those who were offering the sacrifice. Sacrifice was about giving a gift to God and sharing a meal with God. 
and sacrifices served a number of purpose from thank, purposes from thanksgiving to petition to purification and reconciliation, but they generally were not about making a payment to God. They were about restoring our relationship with God. Now, within this context, saying Jesus died as a payment for our sins simply doesn't make a whole lot of sense since there is no payment to be made. So instead, I'd like to suggest a different theory, one that might help us understand why Jesus died such an awful death. It's one that I read in a book that I have in my library called The Last Week, written by progressive Christians Marcus Borg and Dominic Crossan. They say Jesus was a revolutionary. He was a passionate rebel who believed in a cause that ran contrary to the status quo. He was also a protagonist filled with passion about his message, a message about the true nature of God and the way God's realm could and should be lived here on earth. He spoke against the central economic and political institutions that had taken hold in his day, and he attracted a following that took the movement to Jerusalem at, at a pivotal time during the Passover feast. There he challenged the authorities, as we've seen during this sermon series, with public acts and public debate, and it was because of his passion that Jesus was killed. I'm suggesting to you that Jesus didn't die as payment for our sin. Rather, Jesus died because of human sin. He died because of the realities of human greed. He died because of a thirst for power perpetuated by a system of domination that came together and killed Jesus. And as we've seen throughout this season of Lent, Jesus' final week was a sequence of public demonstrations against and confrontations with the domination system of his day. And because he challenged the status quo, the domination system killed him. But let me put it another way a way proposed by Mark Sandlin, who is a Presbyterian pastor and a contributor to Sojourners magazine. Here is what he wrote. In Roman-occupied territories, the one surefire way to get hung from a cross was to be seen as a threat to those in power. Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew that he would be seen as a threat. He knew that it would lead to the cross. I'd even argue that he had known for a while what he was going to do and where it would likely lead because Jesus predicted that he would be given the death penalty, capital punishment, death by crucifixion. Why? Because no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Why did Jesus die on a cross? Jesus died on a cross because he offended those who were in power. Jesus died on a cross because he challenged the status quo. Jesus died on a cross because love would not sit silently by as those who had little were being stepped on, used and abused by those who had so very much. Why did Jesus die on a cross? He died on the cross as an object lesson for us, as a lesson showing us what love in action looks like. Jesus died because of our sin, Jesus died because of his love for us. Amen. <laughs>